Welcome teachers to the Shop Your Pantry Meal Challenge. On the list today, we're going to talk about what is canola and pulses, and we'll explore food neutrality, Canada's food guide, macro and micronutrients and their health benefits, crop production sustainability, and shop your pantry meal challenge. We'll also be looking at how you can apply some cooking and basic math related skills in the kitchen with your students. Joining me today, I have Deborah McLennan with Alberta Pulse Growers. Deb, do you wanna give a quick wave? You bet. Thanks, everybody. Really happy to be here today. I'm Deborah McLennan, as Tara said, a registered dietitian with the Alberta Pulse Growers Commission. We represent the 6,000 farmers who grow field peas, dried beans, chickpeas, faba beans, and soybeans in our wonderful province. We're a not-for-profit organization funded by our farmers with a vision to have pulses on every farm, on every plate. Really excited to share some information with you today. Back to you, Tara. Thanks, Deborah. And I'm Tara Baycroft, the Public Engagement and Promotion Manager with Alberta Canola Producers. We're also a nonprofit organization supporting the approximate 14,000 canola growers across the province. So we're going to talk to you a little bit about today about what is canola to begin with. And so you can see here, so that we've got a image of a canola plant with the different parts of the canola plant, flower, the pods, leaves and stems, roots and seeds, which are further explained in a little bit of a video I have coming up here for you. And off to the left hand side of the screen is the beautiful yellow golden canola flower, as you've all probably seen driving along in the countryside, countryside, pardon me. Canola seeds contain also approximately 45% oil and the rest is used for canola in canola meal, which is often used as a form of animal feed and that kind of thing. So now we'll take a minute and we're going to allow you to check out this neat little video about canola. And next, I'm going to turn it over to Deb to Deborah to allow her to talk about what are pulses. Awesome. Thanks, Thanks Tara. Yeah, usually the question I get is pulse. I've never heard that before. Or if you're talking to your kids, they're going to go like this and think it's pulses. So pulses are the dry edible seed of pod plants. It's an ancient plant species. As you can see here, it's been around for millions of years. The word pulse comes from the Latin word pulls meaning thick soup, and there's different types of pulses that can grow in, in many conditions and regions around the world. I've got this wonderful little chart here. Pulses are part of the legume family, and perhaps you're more familiar with that terminology. So as you can see, the legume family is kind of divided into two sections. We have the oil seed, which is our peanuts and soybeans. Lots of protein, got some fiber in there, but they do contain um, a really wonderful blend of uh, fats and oils in them. Then there's the non-oil seed legumes. So much lower in fat, higher in fiber. And divided that, we've got the undried legumes. So those are those, those, those peas that you see on, on, the store, you know, on the store shelves or on the vines, or green beans or yellow beans, the fresh beans. Pulses are harvested dry. So they're the dry mature seed of a pod plant. And then as I mentioned, chickpeas, cow peas, dry beans, dry peas and lentils are all part of the pulse family. So just to kind of continue on, we do grow a significant amount of uh, number of pulses within our province, but in Canada, uh, they're grown primarily in the, across the prairies, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Manitoba, as you'll see from my little map here, and uh, Ontario as well. And then we have a little bit that grow in, uh, in the province of Quebec. So to kind of blow this up a little bit further, within the province of Alberta, we're kind of divided into these growing zones a lot of it's based on sort of the climate and the soil conditions that you find there. And it dovetails into the zones that, that match the other counterparts of canola, wheat, barley, and such. So within our province, we grow dry peas, we grow green and yellow peas, and they, are, they will grow in, in every zone within our province, as far north as Fairview, Alberta, right down to the, the United States border, and as far east and west as we can go. Fapa beans are the same. This is a wonderful plant that you'll see growing uh, in all different regions across uh, the province too. Peas are our largest uh, pulse crop that we grow the most of. Our second largest pulse crop are our lentils, red and green lentils. They grow primarily in Southern Alberta. So think Calgary down South. So what we call zone one and zone two. 
They like a little bit more heat, a little bit more sunshine. So that's why you'll see them growing uh, more in that particular region. Our third largest crop are our dry beans. Our, our biggest crops are pinto beans, great northern beans and black beans. And they all grow in what we call zone one. So quite far south. So between Tabor, Vauxhall and Bow Island, somewhere in between Lethbridge and Medicine Hat, they like a lot of heat and uh, they're grown under irrigation in that particular area. We grow a few chickpeas in the southeastern corner of the province, kind of around the Medicine Hat area. It's one of our smallest uh, crops. And then salva beans, it just depends on the year. Sometimes it's a large crop, sometimes it's a bit smaller. But again, because they grow all around the province, um, the, the amount that we grow will vary. I'll turn it back over to Tara. Thanks, Deborah. So next we're gonna to talk to you a little bit more about what is food neutrality. So according to the Dietitians for Teachers, which is also referenced uh, down below in the notes section, so food neutrality is going to include uh, the idea that and belief that all food is considered equal and free of judgment, where it also includes eliminating, eliminating value-based labels on food, presenting all foods as good foods, never attaching shame or judgment to foods, the kids or their adults who make these food choices and allowing students to eat their preferred, for preferred foods first. Additionally, food neutrality is about the acceptance, appreciation, understanding, and being curious and seeing the value and the differences in that regards to all traits we encourage our children to embrace. And I'm going to turn it back to Deb to allow her to talk a little bit more about food neutrality and Canada's food guide. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. You kind of have to talk about Canada's food guide. It's part of uh, what's, what you'll find in your uh, health and wellness curriculum. So we've got a new food guide that, we're, that we've been working with. And so food neutrality can actually work quite well along with Canada's food guide. Because um, when you're looking at the food guide, if you flip the guide over, it's a, it's a double-sided document. There's some really wonderful uh, suggestions that are very food positive that we can include in the classroom with our students. So focusing on those positive messages about eating a variety of foods, learning to enjoy your food regardless of what it is, and eating meals with others can enhance that, that uh, positivity around food. Um, the food guide itself, just as a note, it doesn't talk about what foods to eat when or the amounts that should be eaten. So it's about allowing kids to eat the foods that they bring to school in the order and the amount that they choose. That sort of as an adult, the role is to prepare the food, the role of the child is to choose what they're going to eat and how much they're going to eat out of that. The other thing that's kind of interesting when you're looking at the food guide, which again with food neutrality works really well, is that we want to look at using the actual names of foods in the classroom. So chocolate is chocolate, as an example. It's not a treat, a snack, or a dessert. So we're, again, it's about being food neutral. All foods provide nutrients, all foods provide energy, and that's what we kind of want to focus on with kids. And we also, things like snack time, snack is a time, it's not a food. So we don't want to talk about snack foods, but rather, you know, we've got our different meals, we have our different times when we eat foods, and then again, incorporating those foods at those particular times. So again, it's just about, you know, having that more food positivity messaging um, when we're talking with our kids about um, foods and nutrition. All right, so our next slide, uh, I think Tara's going to chat a little bit here about our micro and macronutrients. Thanks, Deborah. So in regards to our macro and micronutrients, what are those? So our macronutrients, we've got to think bigger. So they're needed in bigger amounts and for, as they provide energy, and they're the essential building blocks for growth, movement, repair, and development. These include a, our a bigger food groups, so our carbohydrates, proteins, and our fats, and they make up most of our diet. Whereas our micronutrients, micro think small. So these are needed in smaller amounts. And again, these are contributing to our growth and development and will include our various min vitamins and minerals that we get from food. And carrying on with that, so how the various nutrients help the body. Again, protein is essential building block for muscle and tissue building, maintenance and repair. Our carbohydrates are essential food source for the muscles and cells to perform their jobs in the body. Fat is another source of energy for the body. They help to keep our bodies warm in the winter and protect our vital organs and carry fat-soluble vitamins. 
There's also two types of such two types of fats that we'll talk a little bit more specifically with canola oil, including your saturated and unsaturated fats a little later on. Fiber is helps to keep our digestive tract healthy and keeps us fuller longer, as well as they are an important part of our health, heart healthy and diabetic diets. And lastly, vitamins and minerals help us to see, help us to grow, form bones, muscles, skin, organs, and help us to fight infections, especially during cold and flu season. So I'm going to turn it back to Deborah and allow her to talk about the specific macro, micronutrients and pulses. Thanks, Tara. Yeah, we thought, you know, when we were, we were building this out, we wanted to talk about in general micro, macronutrients and what those are, and then to kind of bring this back to you know, a couple of different foods that uh, that can really be a fun part of uh, everybody's diet. So for pulses in terms of macronutrients, so as Tara mentioned, those larger uh, building blocks within our diets, uh, pulses are an excellent source of plant-based protein, about nine grams per half cup cook serving, also a really great source of complex carbohydrates. So Pulses have a, a quite a large amount of fiber in them, both soluble fiber and insoluble fiber, about eight grams per half cup cooked serving. They are also a source of resistant starch and slowly digestible starch, which I'll talk about in a minute because what, what that really means. And then in terms of those micronutrients, pulses are an excellent source of uh, B vitamins, specifically thiamine, niacin, and folate, and as well, great source of, of the minerals, potassium, magnesium, zinc, and iron. And I put in there a really excellent source of folate. So again, if you're looking to increase those types of nutrients within your, within your diet, pulses can really play an important role in there. So we've got these macro micronutrients. And then if we go to the next slide, this has really, uh, it's those micro and macronutrients that can really have an important role in terms of the health benefits that pulses can provide. Pulses are considered heart healthy. They can help to reduce cholesterol levels and reduce blood pressure. Part of that is because of that type of fiber that is present in there. So um, that soluble fiber, that's the one that uh, helps to, to reduce cholesterol levels, helps with uh, controlling our blood pressure along with the potassium and the minerals that we find in there. Um, pulses are also very low in fat to being fat free. So, you know, no saturated fat. So again, helps contribute to that, to that heart healthy uh, benefit that you'll find there. Pulses are diabetes friendly. Uh, although I've talked about lots of people say, ooh, there's carbs in there, Deb, I don't know. Well, they, because of those complex carbohydrates, because of the fiber content, because of the protein content, the resistant starch, which is not digested in our small intestine, but plays a role in, in helping keep our large intestine healthy, as well as the slowly digestible starch, pulses are considered a low glycemic index food. So they help to keep blood sugars from going too high too fast. So they're a really great component to include into the diet of, of people with diabetes. So it can help really with that blood glucose control. And then for digestive health, a great source of insoluble fiber. So uh, it helps to keep things moving along in our intestinal tract. We often refer to insoluble fiber as nature's broom. So pulses are a really great source of, of that type of fiber. So they can really contribute um, to that, for to keeping our digestive tract healthy. So I'll turn it back over to Tara and she's gonna talk about canola. Thanks, Deborah. So in regards to canola and the macro and micronutrients, so our macronutrients and canola oil specifically are largely our fats. So canola oil is going to contain about 70% monounsaturated fats, 23% polyunsaturated fats. So, and unsaturated fats are considered to be one of the, um, the uh, more, better fats, I guess, for a heart healthy diet, if you want to think about it that way. Uh, polyunsaturated fats also contain our omega-6 and our omega-3 fat, fatty acids, fats, and 7% saturated fats, which we'll look at a little bit more in detail um, in just a minute with our fats chart coming up. In regards to micronutrients, so, so canola oil also contains a lot of, um, has elements of vitamins E and vitamin K as well. And carrying on here. So what you're looking at here is the comparison of dietary fats. So we've got canola oil being compared to some other common cooking oils. And canola oil, as a reminder, is rich in mono and polyunsaturated fats, which are the blue, orange, and yellow lines, and lowest in saturated fats, which is more of the red line. 
And Deb, would you like to talk a little bit more to anything more specific with this? No, I think th this is a really cool chart to, to kind of just take a look so you can see that, um, you know, different oils have different types of uh, uh, fatty acid content. So, um, and the other thing I think that's quite fascinating too is that saturated fat is a solid at room temperature versus uh, polyunsaturated fat, which is a liquid at room temperature. So, you know, that's a really good indication as well when you're looking at different types of uh, fats, you can tell the saturated fat content by whether or not, you know, how liquid or how soft um, the, the fat or the, the, the margarine or something like that is um, based on, on that type of context. So it's kind of an interesting, interesting science fact for you. Thank you, Deborah. And also just one other point I'd like to point out here is that it does have high oleic levels, in which means that the canola oil is highly shelf stable. So making it more useful in large scale food production because it's and because it's so shelf stable, it does not break down under heat so readily. So, and used in things more like cookies and crackers and that kind of thing. All right, so carrying on here. So the health benefits of canola. So it's heart healthy in that it lowers our LDL cholesterol or it decreases the plaque buildup in the arterial walls. It's diabetes, it's diabetes diabetes friendly, pardon me, as it can, helps to control our blood glucose levels, assist in brain development and assist in infant development. And now as Deborah is the registered dietitian, Deb, do you wanna to talk to any other points on that? No, sure, thanks Tara. The, uh, the interesting thing with canola is that because of the type of fat that's in there, because I know lots of times people are going, well, I don't know about fat when I'm looking at, at you know, something being heart healthy. But because of the monounsaturated fatty acid profile and the polyunsaturated fatty acid profile that you find within canola, it contributes to that heart health by helping to lower the LDL cholesterol. So you don't see that plaque buildup. That's the, the buildup along the lining of the arterial walls, which you know, can get thicker and thicker. So including canola oil as part of your diet can help reduce that, that incidence. The same with it being diabetes friendly because of the monounsaturated uh, fatty acid level that you find in there, it helps to contribute to controlling your blood glucose levels. And then when you're looking at the omega fatty acids, so the omega-3 and the omega-6, those are the two fatty acids that are contributing to the, uh, the brain development um, within uh, infants and children. So, you know, lots of really great health benefits associated with having canola as, as part of um, your diet. Thanks, Deborah. And just as well for teachers uh, wondering, we do have additional notes included in the uh, printable version of this uh, presentation with more details. Just refer to the notes section as well as they're more flushed out there for your reference. Okay, I'm going to turn it back over to Deborah. Uh, she's gonna talk to you a little bit more about some fun Paul science facts now. Thanks, Deborah. Well, no problem. Thanks, Tara. So we've, we've been talking about sort of health and nutrition, but we also kind of talking a little bit health and nutrition as it relates to humans. But let's talk a little bit about health and health of the soil. So pulses are a wonderful crop to include as part of crop rotation because pulses are considered to be um, uh, are able to enrich the soil where they're grown. I'm going to go a little bit out of order on my slide. So if you take a look at this, this photo that I've got here, this is the root of a faba bean plant. So we've just gone into the field, we've yanked this out of, out of the soil. Uh, this was probably done around July, end of June, July, because you'll start to see the, these, uh, a really developed root system. So what you're looking at here is if you look really closely, you're gonna see some little white dots on here. So uh, yeah, thanks Tara, she's got the little arrow to show you. These are nodules, and so pulse plants have the ability to partner with bacteria in the soil to form these nodules. And so farmers, what they're looking for as their pulse crop matures in the field, they're pulling out their pulse plants to see what the nodulation is like. They're looking to see how many nodules are forming. So the more nodules, the greater the nitrogen fixation that's going to be happening. So what that means is that pulses are able to take nitrogen from the air partner with these bacteria in the soil to fix their own nitrogen. So they kind of like make their own nitrogen fertilizer. So a pulse crop doesn't require very much or any synthetic nitrogen fertilizer when it's planted in the ground. 
So that's what causes it, causes it. It becomes what we call a low carbon footprint food. It's because of this ability to fix nitrogen that they don't need this synthetic nitrogen fertilizer. The other thing that they do is they help to enrich the soil where they're grown because of this ability to fix nitrogen. So um, they leave behind rich, um, rich residues after, after they've been harvested to help enrich that soil. And what they do is as part of crop rotation, so farmers, what they'll do as part of their cropping plan each year, they look to see what they've planted where, and then the next year they will plant a different crop in that field. So they're not gonna plant fava beans in the same area every single year, they're gonna rotate it around. So perhaps next year they'll plant their canola crop. And what they'll find is that because of that work that the pulse crop has done with the soil, they won't have to use as many uh, nitrogen fertilizers on that crop because the soil has, has been improved due to that uh, pulse crop being there. Pulses are also a very efficient, um, uh, water efficient source of protein. So they don't need as much water to, to produce their protein as other sources. So very adapted to dry environments or you know wet environments. There's a different pulse that'll grow just about everywhere. So lots of really cool fun science facts uh, about pulses and uh, why our farmers include pulses as part of their crop rotation. I'll turn it back to Tara and she's gonna share some fun facts about canola. So in regards to the fun, sustainable facts about canola. So in, uh, regarding canola and sustainability, canola is a pretty cool crop because the biotechnology utilized in canola has actually helped us to produce an extra 8 million tons of canola. And it, the technology used in canola and whatnot um, and canola crops in general also helped to reduce our CO2 emissions. And we've reduced that by approximately 1 billion kilograms. That's about equivalent to removing 50,000 cars off the road. And 86% of farmers who utilize uh, direct tilling versus traditional seeding methods when they seed canola, they also saw a soil erosion reduced overall. And canola and pea plants, again, also help to capture and store carbon dioxide when they engage in photosynthesis to make food for the plants. And they take that carbon dioxide and directly out of the air and capture it. So in regards to how canola production also contributes to environmental su sustainability and stewardship by using bi biotechnology, including different genetic traits, crop protecting and nutrient management, farmers have increased their yield from 26.5 bushels of canola per acre to just over 40 bushels in recent years, which is can also be found, more information can be found about this on the Canadian Canola Council website. And yeah, so in regards to this, canola production is doing its part for social sustainability by producing an oil that is healthy, afford affordable and versatile for all. Uh, and in addition, if you have some extra time, I've included a, a cute little fun video from Canola Council on how canola is utilized by cattle and feedlots with the cow image, if you click on that, and a sweet relationship between bees and canola. You can watch that video at a later time, which talks about the be uh, mutual benefits between canola and bees. So now I'm going to take this moment and turn it back over to Deborah and she's going to talk to us a little bit more about finding nutrients on food labels. Thanks Deb. Thanks Tara. So what I've got here for you is I mean this is this is kind of an interesting one because realistically how do we how do we talk about if we're looking at food neutrality and and uh, you know making messaging about food positive how do we talk about food labels with kids you know, introduce the concept, but yet still make it, you know, something that's educational, but yet still friendly. So what I've got included here is we have a program called the Pulse Cafe for elementary school. And these are a couple of the pages that we've pulled right out of that, just so you can see. So the idea behind this is that food labels, you know, in terms of talking about this with children, they provide very basic information about the macro and micronutrients that we find in food. So I think it's kind of a really great way to introduce this um, for kids. So I've got some examples. It's like I say, these are two pages right out of the workbook. And then I, I took a picture of the bottle of canola oil that I have in my pantry. And this is the nutrition facts table that you'll find on the side of this. So it's kind of an interesting way to, to talk to kids about, you know, 
general initial general questions we can talk about with them is, you know, what do you notice about the labels? What do you think is what's similar on here? What's different? So, you know, things like, you know, looking at, um, oh, they all have, they talk about, you know, the fat content, or they've got carbohydrates on there, or they all have vitamin A, or so it can be very sort of basic initial information about there. And then again, taking it back to, so what are the micronutrients or the macronutrient information that you'll see on these food labels? So then again, helping them to help pick out the macronutrients and the micronutrients that you're going to find on there. So part of this is we've got these as examples here. And then the exercise that we wanted to talk about was that um, getting students to choose three of those food labels and then they can compare the information on there. So this is, again, uh, this is a page right out of our Pulse Cafe. So we've got some questions here that are, that are on the side. So again, keeping that food neutrality in mind, we don't want to say one is worse or better. But what we want to talk about is which one has something like the most iron or which one has the least, which one has the most protein, which one has the least. We're not saying whether it's good or it's bad. We're just stating the facts. These are the facts that you'll find. So looking at similarities and differences um, with those food labels. And then we've got, again, those questions. So let's say they pick three of those items. And if you, you know, again, going back to even math, if you ate all of these foods in one meal, how much fiber would you get from there? And how did you figure that out? So looking at those food labels, you can say, oh, look, it tells me how much fiber is in here and they can add that all together. You can do that with protein, you could do that with calcium, whichever you find uh, on those food labels. So it's just kind of a, it's just kind of a fun way to uh, get to explore what information you find on a food label. And I'll turn it back to Tara because now we're gonna talk about our Shop Your Pantry Meal Challenge. Thank you, Deborah. Finally, the Shop Your Pantry Meal Challenge. Deborah and I are pretty excited to talk to you about this idea because when we were developing this concept for this year, we thought what an interesting, unique opportunity maybe to do some meal planning and with budgeting with students. So your mission was, uh, for the students is to plan a meal or a recipe with a $15 budget. And you, this, you might be helping the students picking a recipe and creating a grocery list, but this is to give them some basic exposure um, to uh, budgeting as per the new curriculum. And then you can also have to encourage the students to research and review what a budget might look like, or you can create and provide an age or developmentally appropriate template suitable to the learning style of your students. We've provided you an example here, the free monthly budget principle for kids for a starting idea on this that you can refer to. And then working through this project. So next you'll use your grocery list or have students consider what they already have available in the pantry and fridge, because we never want to forget that. And they're going to shop their pantry and fridge first. Uh, you might also want to talk to kids about how the, this practice can help reduce food waste and help to meet their budget needs. Then you're going to cost out the recipe. So have the students look up the cost of the items needed to prepare their dinner by visiting a grocery store's website, perhaps, or even comparing between two grocery stores if they're really um, in, into the project and more uh, inquisitive. They're also going to then record the cost of each item and the prices together to see if they're within budget. And finally, they're looking at other things too, such as doing a price comparison, at, again, at multiple grocery stores or consider buying their ingredients in bulk or as part of a larger quantity and maybe teaming up with an additional group. Deborah is going to talk to you a little bit more about step five and I will come back in just a minute. Awesome, thanks Tara. Yeah, so it's an interesting process when you look at you know, preparing a meal or, or even just planning for a recipe. And even when I look back on those steps that we have there, Sometimes maybe they, the kids have chosen a recipe, but if you have, like, if you wanted to take a picture of your own pantry or your own fridge to share with the kids, and I don't know, but sometimes I tend to shop my pantry and my fridge first, and then I figure out what kind of recipe based on what I've got available there. So there's a different, couple of different ways that you can do that challenge. But they, at the end of the day, if, you know, they've done this exercise and they have a bit of money left over, what we could look at is if we want to tie this back into Canada's food guide, looking at the at the food guide plate here. And so for the recipe that they've chosen, 
how does it fit on this plate? Does it, does it fit this, you know, is it lots of fruits and vegetables, but maybe it's a little bit short on, on whole grains, or maybe it's, it's got the, it's got the protein, it's got the grains that are in there, but maybe, maybe it, it could use a little bit more fruits and vegetables. So perhaps this is a way now to go, okay, well, if we want to make this a, you know, fit into the plate here, and we've got a little bit of, of extra money left over, perhaps we could look at what extra things do we need to make this uh, a balanced type of meal. So again, it's another way for, you know, to get develop those critical thinking skills and, and looking and planning ahead. And again, if they're working in a group, they can, they can come up with some different ideas as to how they might be able to, you know, utilize uh, any of that money they, let, they have left over uh, should they choose to do that. Awesome. Thanks, Deb. No problem. So now the even more fun part. So let's bake. So if you refer to our video on the chocolate chip oak cookie uh, video that we've attached here, we're going to go through some more detailed steps and whatnot and how to apply math in the classroom. But you can refer to that link at a later time. And in that video, we'll explore the following, how to read a recipe, understanding the differences between imperial and metric recipes, looking at the difference between dry and wet, measuring cups and when to use each, as kids sometimes get a little confused on that, and how and why it's important to level off dry ingredients. Deborah, is there anything else you would like to add? No, I think you kind of covered it, Tara, but again, it relates back to that pantry challenge as well is perhaps we provided this video just as a backdrop to explain how math is incorporated into cooking uh, and with the recipes and, and the thought process behind it. So um, again, we're showing this example with our chocolate, chocolate chip oat cookie um, video. But again, you could also look at that recipe that the kids have chosen and they could read that recipe. And, you know, even if they don't cook it in the classroom, it can kind of help you and help them to understand the math that is involved uh, with each of the different recipes that they've chosen. Well, we want to thank you guys for joining us today. What We've got a couple of slides here just to wrap this up. We have a lot of wonderful resources available to you free of charge. So we're, we're anxious to have you reach out to us if you're looking for further information. Go to the albertapulse.com uh, website. So we've got the link that's there. Learn Canola, Project Agriculture, as well as uh, some additional resources with lots of great background information available for you to, uh, to supplement uh, the information we've provided for you today. Perfect. And thank you, Deborah, for that. And again, thank you for joining us at, for today's presentation. And for any additional information, please do make sure to reach out to Deborah or myself as we do have additional um, uh, materials on our websites and so forth. And we hope that you've enjoyed this presentation and we'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.